Continuing with our first proving ground, I'm going to go to assignments. I'm going to go to where we post our proving ground. We get to see the, the project description. And most importantly for proving grounds, which are different than assignments, the three rubric criteria we try we want to match in full. So by the end of this project, we want to be able to accurately identify and write down naming the uh, the pixels per inch, <coughs> the physical inches, you know, the print size, and then based on what the resolution is for a print size that's larger than eight by ten whether it's good enough for print resolution, which would be 300 pixels per inch, or whether it's good enough for screen resolution, which would be 72 pixels per inch. We'll talk about that. <coughs> we want to have an image that shows our PNG creature that we made for assignment two, that our PNG cutout creature right here is placed within our assignment one landscape right here in a way that is believable and we do that by trying to match the light direction and the angle of the anatomy so that the, the creature's weight feels like it's in that environment and that the lighting of the environment is affecting the creature right down to things like cast shadows rim lighting, secondary lighting, all of that. And then third, once we've made that image, we get to think about the connections this creature might have with this environment. And then we use our creativity, it's the creative part of problem solving, to offer an explanation in regular language that identifies all the obvious practical problems, concerns your creature would have with its environment. How does it eat? How does it survive? How does it reproduce? All of that good stuff. So let's look at a finished example. I'm going to go to my morning course just to show you what we were able to do there. So it's important to remember that the image itself is not the finished example or the finished project. That's only one of the three criteria. So here is my instructor example. So I have the image. I tried to make the creature's anatomy and angle of that anatomy match the environment. So its foot is firmly planted in the ground there. The other foot is lifted and behind this foreground flower. Um, the lighting is coming from mostly from behind and then there's some reflected light coming from the front as well and so you see most of that lighting on the back of it on the top of it peeking through its its feathers you have core shadows on the inside of it and so it's matching the anatomy and the angle and temperature of the lighting then i I looked at its image size and I saw that at 300 pixels per inch, so I changed it from 350 to 300, but I changed it in a way that didn't change the pixels. It's by unchecked checking resample and image size that I could print this at 300 pixels per inch and it would be 19 by 14 and a half inches, which is well above 8 by 10. So this would be considered print resolution. If I couldn't print it, up to 8 by 10 inches at 300 pixels per inch, then I would see what the pixel, what the inches would be, what the physical dimensions would be if it's at 72 pixels per inch, and then it would be screen resolution. And then I had to look at some of the obvious issues. This is a big bird. It has a flower on its head. Why would it have a flower on its head? Um, what is it doing in this environment? How might they be suited? So I wrote that the Dingle Booby, that was a, a name a student gave it, is a large flightless migratory bird that walks long distances in order to lay eggs in the humidest of environments. It is large and powerful yet depends on burrowing, 
burrowing, that's hard to say, to hide from predators while using its unique head protrusion for camouflage. While bur burrowed or nesting, it feeds mostly on passing rodents, surprising them with its fierce teeth and aggressive jaws. And I got those ideas after putting it in because I thought, well, these kind of weird rocks look kind of like dinosaur egg nests or bird egg nests. And so maybe it does spend a lot of its time like wallowing in the mud, sunk deep so that that little head flower does serve as some sort of protection in these tropical climates. So if you have all three of those things, then you meet all the criteria of the rubric and you can get full marks for the proving ground. Whether the end product is the most magnificent thing you've ever made or not. So let's look at what we've been working on in this class. I've not posted anything yet, but this is what I started in PhotoP with our first video. So I'm going to open up PhotoP. I have all other programs closed, so I'm just using the browser. Today we're trying to turn in our proving ground and then learn a little bit about our next assignment so we can start thinking about it, sketching some rough storyboards before next class. That will be our animation project. All right, so if I open up my PSD file for my proving ground, this is what's going to take up all my focus today. So all I did was move my PNG onto my assignment one landscape. And then I saved it as a new name with save as PSD. And I changed it from assignment one to proving ground number one. And I saved it to the desktop. That's always good. I like to mark it as green. I can see that it updates. First, first thing I need to do is decide how to place my creature in this environment. There's a few options. So let me make a few duplicates of my creature here. Make three copies. They're all smart objects. And I'm going to use Edit Free Transform just to play with different solutions. One is I could shrink my character and place them somewhere like on the top of this fried duck mountain. And by shrinking him or her, I can make this character match in the angle of its anatomy with its environment. That kind of works. The problem is to really show the lighting and the angle, I want my creature to take up at least 25% of the overall picture. And that's a little bit smaller than 25%. That's more like 15%. So this is what I could do next. I could use my guides and reframe my composition. It used to be a landscape format, but maybe I composite it to be more like a vertical format. Because now in this format, my creature not only is angled and made to fit with the environment, I haven't adjusted the lighting yet. I haven't even played much with the, the creature. All I've done is shrink it and move it. But this way it's taking up about 25% of the space just by cropping down around your landscape, right? All right, let's look at another another way. So that's approach number one. Approach number two is I can shrink my creature because a lot of students think of their creature as being kind of a small thing. So I can do edit free transform. And actually the shortcut for that that works in Chrome, I have found, it is option command T. So I will show you. So if you select the layer, I'm not sure why I have a warp turned on. <laughs> ah. Okay. So if I hit, I'll turn off my guides too, so they don't get in the way. So if I hit option command T, I will get a transform box around the layer that's selected. Unfortunately, that's not the layer I want. So I'm going to turn off auto select layer. I'm on my creature layer. It's just photopia is being laggy. 
And now if I hit Option Command T, I'll get a transform box for my creature. And I want to make it small, but I want to use more of my landscape. So I want to put some of them behind the, uh, the French fries here. I can sink them down behind the French fries. Make a duplicate of it. I want to put some of them, Option Command T, flip them up on top of the hills, but they're going to be far in the distance now, right? So they're going to be even smaller. Like grazing on this fast food landscape. And I can do others, maybe bigger. They're all still smart objects. Whoops. Option Command T, not just Command T. And maybe I put another in the extreme foreground. You know, in front of the Move the layer up. Come on. There we go. In front of the french fries. So you can also take up 25% of the space just by having multiples of your character. It kind of depends what fits your concept, your idea. And then the third approach, <laughs> and I don't really want to do the multiple approach because it takes up a lot of layers. There it is. These are all the smart object ones. Okay. The third approach is what I did with the morning class, and that's use your whole thing, use your whole landscape, but figure out a way to place your creature so that your single creature is big enough to take up at least 25%, if not more. So then I have to figure out, okay, what does it make sense for this creature? How do I angle it? Where is it standing? How can it work? Let's see. And I think it should go behind the french fries there and look like it's about to eat these french fries there. And so I'm going to position it this way. Plenty big. So it's definitely showcasing the creature. So if I do that, I can go either way. I did this with the morning class. Maybe with this class, I like this approach better. So I use my guides, and then I crop it down. I'm having a lot of trouble with photo P lagging hmm it was so let me do this let me get rid of these layers of the approaches I don't want and then let me simplify my landscape layers a little bit because I don't need every single layer anymore what I actually need, come on, delete, are some atmosphere layers, and I need foreground, middle ground, and background layers. And if it will let me crop, that will actually save a lot of memory too. So I'm just going to crop it first. Remember, this is not assignment one. This is your proving ground. So we're not hurting anything by cropping. <coughs> so now let me see if I can simplify my landscape. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm going to delete any elements I don't need. I might even bring it, bring around some elements and use them in a different way, like more of these french fries in the foreground. <laughs> 